Good evening. My name is Ed McCartan. I've been in the financial services industry since 1974 when I joined the Chicago Board Options Exchange, newly formed that year, and then spent 10 years as an independent floor trader there and on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange for about 10 years. After that, I moved into larger financial institutions, working for Solomon Brothers, J.P. Morgan, Robertson Stevens, which is a sub of a large regional bank here in the Northeast, and specialized in trading equities and their derivatives, futures, options, and over-the-counter swaps for the entire portion of my career. What I'd like to talk about tonight are some of the things that I think that we can do to begin to rein in these institutions that we refer to as being too big to fail. <laughs> Having spoken about the sort of systemic risk that their transactions have created, what is to be done? The financial intermediaries in this country have enjoyed the fruits of deregulation greatly and have taken an enormous share of the corporate profits of the United States. This is a chart of their share. Traditionally, the financial intermediaries have made 12 to 16 percent of the overall economy, but now they stand as a colossus astride virtually all of our commerce. And before the attacks on New York, and the collapse of the equity market in 2001, they accounted for nearly 46% of all the corporate profits in the United States. That is very, very big. And when you think how they touch all aspects of our economy and all aspects of our ability to borrow, whether it's at the individual level, the corporate level, or even the governmental level, they have in my opinion, undue influence. Then what do we do? How do we begin to bring some sense of order and proportion back to this industry? I would argue that now is the time that we break up these institutions. The Dodd-Frank legislation has taken some steps in that direction. Dodd-Frank mandates that these institutions, the so-called too big to fail, must create so-called living wills. They need to detail how, if they do get into financial distress, that they are going to shed businesses in order to cut down their size and to cut down the risk that they present, not only to the domestic banking system, but the global domestic banking system. And I would applaud Dodd-Frank for that concept. Because what we learned in 2008 was that we couldn't dismantle Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers in a, in a fashion rapid enough that could have saved them. Their ships sank very, very quickly. And the lesson that I learned from that experience is that when you have entities which are in distress, you virtually cannot sell your subsidiaries at any price because every potential buyer knows that you must sell them. There's an expression in the securities business that says, sell when you can, not when you have to. Because when you have to, the takers are going to give you very, very little for what you're, you're seeking. For example, when Bear Stearns collapsed and they were taken over by J.P. Morgan with various guarantees against loss, by the Federal Reserve Board, the price that they initially offered Bear Stearns was equal to the value of their headquarters building, and nothing more. Not their personnel, not their customer relationships, and not their book of assets. They offered the absolute minimum. The lesson from that is that you cannot wait to be in a position of distress if you're going to make a logical exit from catastrophe. You have to avert it. You have to get in and start shedding these businesses now. 
you need to get out of businesses that were traditionally not your province. How do we do that? I would argue that we need to reinstate the Glass-Steagall Act that keeps commercial banking apart from investment banking. The fundamental concept behind Glass-Steagall was we don't want banks taking inordinate risks in the securities markets when the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation guarantees those deposits. That would be backstopping risky behavior with taxpayer money and with the insurance premiums that are paid in by the banks. Instead, just this month, on October 18th, Bloomberg reported that after a downgrade of Merrill Lynch, which is owned by Bank of America, the customers of Merrill Lynch said, you know, we're a little bit concerned about having you as a counterparty in our swaps trades. Would you please move these trades onto the books of the bank? The Fed encouraged Merrill Lynch and Bank of America to make that movement. We don't even know how much it was. Those swaps positions are now on the books of a bank which is FDIC guaranteed. So now we as the taxpayers are insuring their risky behavior. We as the taxpayers are directly insuring the risks that Bank of America just assumed. The Federal Deposit Insurance Company voiced their complaints. They have not had a response. The Fed will not speak to the issue. The FDIC has not spoken to the issue. And Bank of America has had only mild things to say about the way that they interact with their customers. If they will not conform in a way which takes the risk out of all of our hands, then they need to be stopped from assuming those risks. Another lesson learned from the 2008 crisis is we need to make the investor world clearly conscious that there will not be further bailouts. That in the event that there, is, that there are financial problems in these institutions, the first line of defense will be shareholder capital and all the remaining bondholders. And then we'll figure out what's left with the rump of the company. We're not going to let the taxpayer bear the risks of further bailouts through the Treasury. If you look at the way the bonds of these big, big banks trade right now, they trade at a lower yield than they would if there were no implicit government backstop. So they are receiving, if you will, a form of insurance for which they do not pay, but for which all taxpayers will ultimately pay, as we did in 2008. We have to make it clear to shareholders and bondholders that they are the parties at risk. And therefore, let them go to the management of these organizations and say, how carefully are you running your risks? Is your loan book too big? Is your swaps book too big? And let the actual owners of these companies put the onus of responsibility on the managements. What else can we do? We need to enforce the regulations that exist. And regulations that should be binding both banks and investment banks, many of which have been the law of the land, since the, the Great Depression in the early 30s are simply not being enforced. We have seen regulatory enforcement groups in the various regulatory agencies gutted in the name of the value of deregulation. We're at the point now where, for example, mutual fund companies who are subject to SEC jurisdiction are being audited and reviewed once every 11 years. We have departments of enforcement in the SEC who are twice tipped off by a major hedge fund investor about precisely how Bernie Madoff was running a Ponzi scheme on his investors. And they provided a list of questions that SEC investigators should use to go in and question Madoff. 
Both letters were met with no action by the Department of Enforcement. And the philosophy of the first eight years of this decade was that no regulation is the best regulation. We have had agencies which are perfectly capable of conducting reviews, not conducting reviews, and not enforcing their regulations. We need to raise capital requirements on the banks. We need to say to them, you can't rely on the United States Treasury to be your backstop. You need to have more capital to conduct this business. That would have two ancillary effects. It would actually reduce bank profitability because they couldn't have as much leverage if more capital were required. It would restrain their profitability relative to all other corporate earnings and try to get them back into a more traditional historical range. And it might also have something to do in reining in the sort of compensation that we're seeing. We have seen Wall Street pulling away talent from people who might otherwise be involved in physics and high-end engineering, working for alternative energy solutions, doing all sorts of things that physicists and engineers do, but they're highly valued on Wall Street. I had two physicists working for me when I ran the derivatives book in, in California. They're being pulled away because Wall Street can pay them compensation that they would be unlikely to experience in other more productive industries. Swaps trading is so large in comparison to global GDP and the size of the ability of nations, let alone central banks, can handle. We need to bring swaps trading onto regulated exchanges where they're, they're reviewed, they're audited, sufficient capital requirements are enforced, and where the collective risk of the swaps is shared by all the member firms. This is very much the model of a futures market. All participants are very wary of all other participants because one member's loss redounds to the loss of all the others. We need to collectivize their risk in their hands, not in the hands of the taxpayer. Would that shrink the, the swaps market? It would, to be sure. But the world existed quite well without swaps. They didn't, they didn't necessarily have perfect hedges, but they had the ability to hedge to a degree. I don't think that we need to in, in, inform corporations with perfect hedge opportunities through the swaps market when the ultimate guarantor are the taxpayers. We also need to raise the insurance premiums on the banks. If Bank of America is going to be taking Merrill Lynch's swaps book and sort of ignoring the concerns of the FDIC, then make them pay a higher price because their risk is higher. If you have an automobile accident, your automobile premium, insurance premiums are not going to remain the same. They're going to be higher by a lot. We should do so accordingly. We also need to tax financial transactions. Again, as taxpayers, we need to be repaid for the costs that they imposed on us, on the Treasury and on the Federal Reserve Board. And in order to get lending going again, we need to say you can't sit, sit there with excess reserves and earn this rent for doing nothing. There's no reason why we have to pay their light bills. So what are the conclusions that we can draw from this? The interconnectedness of all banks through swap transactions are a, mark, are a problem